Greetings, friends, and welcome to The Right Direction. This is Pat Franks. Before World War I, the land now comprising the nation of Israel was controlled by Turkey. It was a little more than a waste for hundreds of years, having been deforested. It had turned to swamp and desert and was basically useless. The Jewish people, of course, were scattered all over the world. There were only about 25,000 of them living in what, is not, what was then called Palestine in, uh, in the 1880s. But there was a new force on the field of world politics. A man by the name of Theodore Herzl, a journalist, had begun having international meetings of Jews and Christians and religious leaders and academics and uh, political figures and others who were interested and believed that uh, these scattered children of Abraham should have uh, their own homeland. Well, a special interest to the Bible-believing people in those groups were scriptures like Isaiah 11 that said, The Lord shall set his hand to recover the remnant. He shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And also uh, those who believed in Bible prophecy that were uh, mostly Christian, uh, they took special interest in verses that seemed to imply that the Gentile world would have something to do with facilitating this return of the Jews to the land. Isaiah chapter 66 mentions, I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall bring all your brethren out of all nations to my holy mountain, Jerusalem. That's, uh, that's pretty interesting. Well, at the same time, the British Empire was at its peak, and among some of the prominent uh, people, the authorities of the British Empire, were some people who were devout Christians who really did believe that the Bible was true, and they were more than ready to help make this prophecy come true. Now, a lot of people saw the war coming, and their thoughts were that uh, if, uh, if Turkey, if Germany uh, aligned itself, and Turkey aligned itself with Germany and the other Axis powers, there might be a, uh, a situation presenting itself that would allow the, the, the freeing of Turkey or freeing of the land from Turkey and possibly even securing it uh, for the Jews as a homeland. But that was in, that was in no way a, a certain thing. So as a result, all kinds of high-level negotiations were taking place among world leaders and especially the leaders of the British Empire, and we might think that some of those conversations uh, took a turn into what what would be bizarre thinking, at least for us today. For instance, it was suggested that uh, the Jews might settle for a homeland outside the land of Palestine, which uh, now uh, involves Israel, of course, but they suggested they might settle for Cyprus or even Uganda. And Theodore Herzl was in a meeting with Joe Chamberlain, who at that time was the uh, Secretary of State for the British colonies. And Chamberlain was going on and on and giving him a speech, more or less. And he uh, brought up Uganda and Cyprus. And when they decided that wouldn't work, uh, then he, and I quote, he said to Herzl, uh, if he would point to a spot among the British possessions that is not yet inhabited by white settlers, we can talk. That's an interesting statement, but he went on to say, perhaps Egypt. Well, Herzl had been quiet and respectful up to this point, but when he heard that, uh, he responded with a very firm, no, we're not going to Egypt. We've been there. <laughs> and had they ever. It was, of course, a, a reference to uh, the Bible story about Israel being slaves in Egypt during the time of Moses. And it was a terrible time uh, for the Israelites in Egyptian slavery. In fact, e Exodus chapters 3 through 6, you can read the description of that time and, and you'll find words like oppression and sorrows and crying and bondage and burdens. So that Egypt in time became a type in the Bible a synonym for sin and the world. 
By the time we get to 1 Corinthians 10, the Apostle Paul presents a whole chapter there comparing the, the departure of the fathers from, from Egyptian bondage coming through the wilderness as a type of, uh, of, of people in the New Testament era leaving sin behind. But Paul wrote about those people. He said their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. They were snake bit. They were destroyed. And he said uh, they were examples for us. But then he comes on down to verse 16, and he says in verse 16 that there is a cup of blessing available for us. Praise God. So who's interested in going back to Egypt? Not me. I've, I've been there. Give me the cup of blessing. Now, this might even be a lesson for our nation today. Over the last several weeks, we have, uh, or over the last several decades, we have seen our nation, uh, what happens to people when they expel God from their social lives and from the halls of academia and, and the halls of government. Uh, we end up with a society where babies are aborted and their little bodies are cut up and the parts are sold to the highest bidder. We have individuals who are uh, having trouble with psychiatric problems and incurable physical diseases and our schools have become killing fields and uh, the government is taken over in many cases by tyrants and fools. Well, I've, I've had enough of Egypt for my, uh, as far as I'm concerned. I'm not interested in that. We've, we've been brought to a crawl in the last couple of months with this pandemic. And hopefully people have, have been considering, hopefully we all have been considering that as a corporate body and as individuals, we must all give an account to Almighty God for our sins. Hopefully we're thinking that way. Personally, I don't want to return to a society that rolls carelessly onward. I've been there. Give us a place where we can live in the promises of God, a place of real security where we choose each step carefully as we have in the last few days and weeks with the quarantines and, and the pandemics. Give us, give us a place where uh, we can see some fruitfulness, where we invest our energies and our resources in something more than, than just an instant gratification, where the presence of God is not just a cliche that we use to get a fast amen from our congregations or a loud applause, but it's a reality, a place where we're rooted in something eternal. And if the proposition does present itself, well, you can always go back to Egypt, we'll respond with a resounding, no, we're not going to Egypt. We've been there. We're going toward the promised land. We're going toward Canaan. Now, some people think that Canaan or the promised land is is a type of heaven, but I don't think so. Canaan had giants and it had fortified cities and it had enemies and I can't see heaven having any of those. Heaven's our reward. I want to go to heaven, but there's something before we get to heaven, if I read the Bible correctly. There's a land of victorious Christian living and that's what Canaan symbolizes to me, the opposite of Egypt. Egypt, the type of sin and the world. We've been there, Egypt that is, and we've had enough of that. We're not going back. We're moving toward Canaan. We're moving toward a promised land of victorious Christian living. That is the right direction. Bless you, folks.